Welcome home. I'm back home in the house of God. One day spent in your house. One day spent in your house, this beautiful place of worship. Be thousands. Be thousands spent on Greek island beaches. Let me tell you why you're here. Why you are here. You're here to be the salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. You're here to be light. You're here to be light. Be light. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret. Not a secret. God is not a secret to be kept. To be kept. We are going public with this. We're going public with this. As public as a city on a hill. The mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all. The most important place on earth. The most important place on earth. Place on earth. Good morning. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning, say hi to three or four people around you. We will get started. Come on, put your hands together. Here we go.
service. And this is your Connect Band. Hey, we're glad to have all of you here and all watching online today. It's a great morning. Great to be here to worship. And you know, time now where we're going to turn around a little bit. We're going to go into more worship here. Here's a time for you to reflect on yourself and prepare yourself for the message.
You may be seated this morning. How many are missing that snow and ice we had last week? Yeah, yeah, you can go back to Minnesota if you want to. <laughs> we want to thank the Lord that it's gone. Amen. And believing together that spring is here. So anyway, as we go before the Lord in prayer this morning, uh, we have uh, several prayer needs. Um, Mary Kearney founding member of this church passed away this past week and we'll be having uh, memorial arrangements will be announced as we know uh, but anyway a great saint of the Lord to be praying for their family and uh, we have a, a, a joy though and that is the Van E's son is home after a heart transplant surgery just doing great that's awesome thank you Jesus and another prayer request we have is sitting right here in the room this morning, Betty, and looking good, needs her prayers. She's still still working on recovering and needs uh, regaining her strength and be praying for Betty Etherly. Neil McLean has some ongoing health concerns, need to pray for him. And then we have several, several families, too many. We've lost too many friends in this church in the last couple weeks, and we need to be praying for those families that have lost loved ones and, and good friends of ours. And so uh, let's just lift them up to the Lord. It's been very, very difficult. Uh, this week we're also praying for First Presbyterian Church, and the school that we're praying for is Reed Springs Schools. And, of course, we always want to remember our military personnel, our policemen, firemen, all those who make us safe and well. Let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you, God, that you're with us. God, that you never leave us or forsake us. Father, you're so awesome. You're so wonderful. And God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to people's lives today that need a touch from you. God, we just thank you and praise you that you're interceding on their behalf. We pray especially for those that have lost loved ones. Father, in the last several a uh, week, uh, couple weeks, God, that you would be with those families, God. I thank you and I praise you, Father, that you're, that you're touching them and being with them. We pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Before we go into the announcements video this morning, uh, you'll see it in the video, but I want to remind you that next Sunday is a little bit different. We're having one combined service in the sanctuary at 9.15 a.m. next Sunday only, and that is because the kids are going to be doing their production of the three um, three trees, and it's just uh, it's an awesome little show. If you came back in November and you saw their production, then you know it's going to be a special time. So you don't want to miss that next week. And here's what else is happening at Kimberly City United Methodist Church. Beyond. 
this King of angels, oh blessed Prince of Peace, revealing things of heaven and all its mystery. Is this King of glory, Son of God and Son of Man? His name is Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, King of kings, Lord of earth and heaven, the creator of all things, he is the king of glory, he's everything. Jesus was just a story made up by someone. Could have been probably a, a, a real person. It's something special, but uh, not, not, not like the story says. Yeah. I'm actually glad you're all here tonight. I want to tell you that one of you will betray me. Nah, <laughs> just kidding. Ah, he's doing that thing he did in his storybook. Uh, Jesus, a friend of mine from Puerto Rico. I don't know. I, I don't know Jesus very well, so... Jesus? Like, Jesus? The Son of God? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Definitely not the guy who cuts my lawn. Dear Tiny and for Jesus. Hey, um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off-putting to pray to a baby. Well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. Yes, there's definitely something special about Jesus. The same things that are special about me and you and, well, everybody. Definitely good morals and beliefs, and um, possibly had some special gift. Oh, oh my God! Jesus. Oh my God. It's, it's him! Jesus. It's Jesus! And his best pal, Peter! Oh, 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 wow! Who do you say Jesus is? <sighs> He's really important. His birthday's coming up. People, believe in Jesus. He's your savior. He's number one. Everyone is giddy with anticipation for Jesus to come out because, as we all know, if Jesus comes out of his house and is not scared by his shadow, it means the next thousand years will be full of peace and love. He's just really chill. I think he even smoked some pot, so I love Jesus even more. 
He seems like a kind of Gandhi type guy. Some superpower, I just don't know. I, I believe in him, in him so. <laughs> uh, he was Jewish. Look, I think he's inspiring for a lot of people, so that's really cool to me. God bless him. <laughs> a make-believe story that Scott blown out of proportion. So that's the topic of the first talk in our series in Christ Alone from the book of Hebrews, Who is Jesus? And uh, I wanted you to see that video clip because it's just this random sampling of going out into busy streets and starting to ask people, who is Jesus? And you get pretty random answers when you do that, don't you? Did you have a favorite one out of all of those in answer to the question, who is Jesus? Okay. Trisha said the guy in the blue jacket who said he's my Lord and Savior. Yes, sir, Russ. Okay. <laughs> yes. The tiny infant Jesus. <laughs> That's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But as you see, there's a lot of ideas about who is Jesus. So uh, we're going to address that from a, just from a brief scriptural glimpse about the identity of uh, Jesus from the book of Hebrews. It's by no means definitive or exhaustive or anything. It's just kind of touching the surface and giving you something to think about and some things to take with you and hopefully some encouragement. But as each uh, message or talk out of this series comes from the book of Hebrews, I wanted to do just a little bit of background or introduction of the book of Hebrews. Here's what's one of the really interesting things about it. Almost every book in the New Testament names its author. Uh, the letters that Paul wrote and, uh, and by the way, some people still think Paul wrote Hebrews too, but all of his letters, they begin in the first or second paragraph by identifying Paul as the author. He usually states who he is, a little bit of his background and credentials, and his purpose for writing that letter, either to one of the churches, a group of churches, or to an individual to share with the churches. Okay, the book of Hebrews, you do not have uh, anything that identifies an author like that. Um, Early on in my Bible studies, I uh, was told, well, we don't really know who the author of Hebrews is, but it was probably Paul, and we'll just accept that. So for a long time, I was just content to say, you know, Paul probably wrote Hebrews. He didn't say it, but probably wrote it. Digging deeper, however, I discover that uh, the style of Greek used in writing that is an entirely different style of Greek than what Paul consistently used in all of his letters. If you discovered that, what would it tell you about the, the other letter that's a different style of, lang of that language? Probably not the same author, right? I mean, not to say that one writer can't write in two different styles, but you wouldn't adopt a different style of the language probably for one when you'd been consistent in all the others. So I finally came to the conclusion Probably not Paul. Now, some people have said they think it could have potentially have been uh, Barnabas. Um, that, that is a possibility. Another reason I think it probably wasn't Paul is Paul was executed in Rome uh, somewhere between 64 and 67 AD. And I think the earliest we can date the writing of Hebrews is 70 AD and possibly as late as 80. Would that also lead you to conclude maybe it wasn't Paul who wrote it? Possibly not Paul. Okay. But there's been a lot of speculation and no firm conclusions formed. Again, as I mentioned, it was uh, written possibly as early as 70, but no later than 80. So somewhere in that decade is the origin of this incredible book of Hebrews, packed with deep theology about Jesus Christ and his role as a, a priest and a redeemer, uh, lots of doctrinal application, and lots of encouragement for believers are in that book. Um, 
Many scholars will tell you that it could have been written in Italy somewhere. And many more would tell you, well, if it wasn't written in Italy, it was written in another location for the churches in Italy. So now we're getting a little bit of somewhere, right? Uh, so now, here's, get, take out your pen and paper, your name in the top right-hand corner, and write on the page who you believe wrote the book of Hebrews. You get M&Ms if you win. Oh, wait, we, since we don't know, we can't tell if you won or not, right? Right? Ah, so everybody wins. Uh, don't know if we got that many M&Ms. Uh, okay, so, so here's what we're building up to. Hey, do y'all want to know what my best guess is on who wrote Hebrews? Anybody want to know that? Thank you. Thank you for indulging me. I appreciate that. Uh, Okay, so here's my, here's my story on this. It, uh, it's not, I'm, I'm going to give you just a very, very brief version of a gigantic, huge story, okay? Big story condensed down to a tiny one, okay? So, to start with, Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 makes this passing comment, which you see something like this in most of his letters, okay? And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 21... He says something to the, my paraphrase, he says, Eubulus sends you greetings, and so do Linus and Claudia and Pudens. And he just goes on about his talking. Okay, so the Linus that he mentions there became the first bishop of Rome a short time later. And I am going to say that it is very likely that Linus was the author of Hebrews. But get this. Also very possible that his sister, Claudia, who was co-leading the church in Rome, was a co-author. If that's true, that would mean it's the only New Testament book that was potentially uh, ha had female authorship. But here, so here's the story. How did they get there? Because Linus and Claudia were not Romans. As a matter of fact, they were British. And when Emperor Claudius was attempting to defeat the British Isles, one king of a region there, of what we would know as Cornwall, um, fiercely defended the area and they couldn't really defeat them. But uh, they eventually did capture King Caradoc, or you might know him as Caradactus. Both names are the same guy. Took him to Rome, imprisoned, but he made this appealing speech before all the Roman authorities and so impressed everyone, including Emperor Claudius Caesar, that they decided to make a peace agreement with his area of Britain. And as part of that, though, what they did, and this wasn't so uncommon, something similar was done about 400 years earlier with Antiochus. Uh, you might know him as Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, was taken to Rome as part of a peace agreement. The peace agreement was King Caradoc's son and daughter, Linus and Gladys, would come and live in Rome. And as a matter of fact, they did. And Emperor Claudius was so taken with Gladys that he renamed her with his, the Roman name and after himself, Claudia. Claudia married a guy named Rufus Pudens, who is also mentioned there. And Pudens, Rufus Pudens, is Paul, the apostle's half-brother. Uh, from you'll get that from uh, Romans chapter 16 verse 13 but how this all came about was shortly after the crucifixion resurrection um, just a few years after that Joseph of Arimathea who had buried Christ in his tomb ended up back in Britain where he had done much trading before and he landed there back at about 37 AD and it says where he, he was the first one to bring the gospel there. And he began, he was greeted by a delegation from King Caradoc when he arrived there and given land and several things like that. But his very first person that he baptized was the king's daughter, Gladys. 
Later, Gladys and Linus, her brother, were taken to Rome where they stayed at a place called the Palatium Britannica. My reading on that gives up that there could have been as many as 400 servants working at the Palatium Britannica. Quite a prison that they lived in. Uh, We might today identify that as the British Embassy in Rome. But Paul discovered Claudia and Linus as the leaders of this robust, growing church in Rome when he finally arrived there um, around 60 AD. And that's why his book to the Romans, he is so careful to describe all of his theology. It's like a work of systematic theology. He knew that the leaders in the church at Rome uh, really came before his apostleship and were very learned and theological in their understanding of the gospel and the future uh, prophecies and all of that. So he was very careful in putting out a systematic theology in the book of Romans to uh, kind of establish himself with them. A little bit later, he finally arrives there, and those leaders greet him. Claudia, formerly known as Gladys, her brother Linus, and her husband, Rufus Pudens, the Roman senator, who is a half-brother of Paul. Did you get all that? So... I believe it's very likely that Linus of British royalty leading the church in Rome became the first bishop of Rome was probably the author of the book of Hebrews. You didn't record that, did you? Okay. Uh, Going on the the record with that. Okay. So this is a substantial work of theology and it is... uh, carefully thought out in the way that it's presented. It's not random uh, stream of consciousness or uh, uh, random thoughts put together. It's a very carefully constructed theological work when you get into Hebrews. And if we ask the question of the book of Hebrews, who is Jesus? If we were to look at Hebrews for the answer, I would come away from that simply saying, the Bible tells us that Jesus is God. Now, some would say, no way, he's the son of God. God. Well, then, then who was he before he was born as a human? The Trinity becomes a very difficult to explain or understand, doesn't it? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If Jesus is sit at the right hand of the Father, how can he be God? Well, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit are God. It's complicated and difficult for us to grasp, yet altogether true. The Bible tells us that Jesus is God. The scripture in Hebrews chapter 1, the first four verses I would like to read, um, give us a little bit of background on that. Here it is. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs." And so here is just a brief sketch starting into the description of Jesus, and we get that he is the exact representation of who God is. And he created all things, and by him all things uh, exist or have their very being. That's an amazing thing to be saying about this individual that we call Jesus Christ. The reality is it's telling us he is 100% deity. He is God. We read in the Gospel of John, for example, in the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We read, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You get it. And we also read, the world was made by Him, but didn't recognize Him. And we start to get into this, that by Him were all things created, whether in heaven or in earth or anywhere in the universe, all things were made by Jesus Christ by the word of God. 
And we also read that by him all things uh, consist or have their being or their essence and all the universe, all of time, eternity, and the physical world are held together by the will of this one that we call Jesus Christ. Amazing, isn't it? So when you ask who is Jesus, short answer, long answer, complicated answer, simple answer, because this could take a while. One of the thinkers that I kind of like, and, and I say kind of like, I would say 94 to 96% of the time, Richard Dawkins. And uh, uh, here's a, a statement by Richard Dawkins that represents uh, more uh, what we would find in our world today. Richard Dawkins said, uh, gods are fragile things. They can be killed by a whiff of science or a dose of common sense. And that should be on your slide right now, I do believe, um, at some point. There you go. Perfect. Uh, now, notice this. Here is where I agree with Richard Dawkins almost all the time. There are multiplicity of gods, little g, that have been invented and made up through mythology or just made up religions and ideas and everything else that have been worshipped or followed or that sort of thing who have no substance, no being, and some of them are mere physical objects. And I would say that that is probably 94 to 96% of everything that's thought of as a god is there. And so I'm in agreement with Richard Dawkins. So in that other 4 to 6% remaining here, I'm saying, but the one thing you're not allowing for is the possibility that there is one true and living God over all who created all of this. Okay, unpopular today. And, and many people will back away as soon as you start to uh, um, articulate that sort of belief. You know what I have learned? That you will never argue anyone into a relationship with Jesus Christ or into a change in their viewpoint. So I, I'll never go and argue that with anyone. I just don't see it as fruitful. On the other hand, they might hear that you actually believe that, but they might see from how you treat them or how you act toward them or how you're consistent in your life enough to cause them to investigate and begin looking at their own belief system and come to a knowledge of Jesus. It can happen because God is always at work in the heart of every human being as long as they're breathing. God never gives up, never gives up on you, will never give up on any unbeliever in all the world. Truth is, we just can't argue them into believing in Jesus. So Richard Dawkins, I'm with him on that statement most of the time. Like I said, solid 94%, maybe 96, somewhere in there. But get this, also Richard Dawkins, also same guy, and he said, Animals give the appearance of having been designed by a theoretically sophisticated and practically ingenious physicist or engineer. Uh, so just a little bit self-contradictory in his various statements. But granted, those could have come at different points, you know, in his evolving thinking on matters. Uh, nevertheless, on this one, I'm 100% with him. Every living creature shows incredibly complex design. Even when they thought, you know, the simple single cell had nothing to it. Um, and therefore, everything came from a random source. Then suddenly, that was invaded and discovered that within inside a single cell is an entire universe of stuff going on in there. And suddenly the complexity comes out to say, yeah, yeah, maybe not so random. The complexity and the precision of it all do lead one to think about exactly what Dawkins is saying here. Theoretically sophisticated and practically ingenious physicist or engineer. I'm with him. So talking about Jesus, 
Here, just a few, a few thoughts that we pull out of some of this writing in Hebrews about him. First of all, the tough one to get it out of the way first. He created the world, by the way. That's it. He created the world. He created eternity, which is a concept alone that's difficult for us to even grasp. A dimension where time doesn't matter and doesn't exist because there's no way to measurement the, measure the passage of time. And yet to be able to somehow within that formulate a capsule where is there, there's a thing called time that exists and that's where we all are. Eternity is completely outside the boundaries of time and the measurement and the existence of time, correct? It's not an a, a ever going timeline. It is boundless in all directions where time doesn't matter or exist anymore. I know that's a little difficult. We could spend years just getting, getting our thoughts wrapped around that, couldn't we? But by the way, Jesus made that, created it, and us, and everything about us and our world. That's pretty significant. Unrivaled. Nothing to even approach that. In, I mean, not even to the size of a grain of sand compared to all the beaches of the world could we even begin to approach that. He created the world. But here's another one. He paid the price for our sins. And you know what? Most people I know who are part of a church and would consider themselves a Christian would say, yep, I believe that. But I'm also learning that most churches are pretty filled with people who would say, yeah, Jesus died for our sins and, and all of that, and we can believe that, but we also must do these things if we want to get God's gift of eternal life and have a relationship with God. Oh, really? So what things? Well, you've got to become a good person. You've got to do some religious ceremonies. You've got to turn your life around. You've got to make restitution for the wrongs of your past. And so then I begin saying, well, what if you can't remember every single thing and make restitution for it all? Then you fail. Because if you missed one, you same as missing everything, right? Or what if you don't perform at a high enough standard of righteousness or you're not religious enough or good enough? How would you ever know? The reality is Jesus paid the price for our sins 100% in full. We must dispense with the idea that we have to add something to that by creating in us some kind of goodness or righteousness to stack on top of that and say, now there, that's good enough. Because in reality, if we're doing that and believing that way, we're not honoring Jesus. Think this one through with me. Carefully think about this. If we believe that, we're not honoring Jesus, but insulting him. It's the same as if we said, hey, Jesus, yeah, you know that dying on the cross stuff and all that you did and suffering and dying on the cross and everything? I appreciate that, but it's not quite enough. Here, let me add my part to it. You get it? It's Jesus who paid the price, not 90% Jesus and 10% you or 99% Jesus and 1% you, 100% Jesus. It is believing that that opens the door to God's goodness and God's favor and eternal life and that relationship with God. That's how you worship him, by believing that you had no other hope but him. Once you get that and you have a full appreciation for his sacrifice for you, you can worship him now. You had no other option, ultimately. As a matter of fact... If there had been some other way, it wouldn't have been necessary for Jesus to die on the cross. And we'd say the same thing. Yeah, thanks, but we had, yeah, we had another way already. But yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah. He paid the price for our sins. Cannot understate that. Cannot underestimate the value of that. And I would also say he has done all that he set out to do. When he was born in the human flesh and walked this earth all the way up to the point of the crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and ascension, he completed it. As a matter of fact, his last words on the cross, it is finished. He said it. It's finished. And it says, of course, after the resurrection, all of that, 
He ascended on high, and then it says he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And they co-reign there. All eternity. Now, you see, he didn't sit down to rest because he was tired. It goes back to uh, the same as in Genesis when we read of God creating everything. Did God rest on the seventh day because he was tired or because he was done? <laughs> he finished, so he rested. We're told that God never sleeps and never slumbers. He ever makes intercession for us unceasingly. He is intervening on our behalf. Don't need anybody else to do it. God's doing it. Jesus Christ is interceding for us. But let me wrap up with just some of these personal thoughts about what does it mean for us to know who Jesus is. First of all, you can know him personally. It's not some distant historical figure, although Jesus was entirely a person of history, real calendar history. But you can know him personally because he's alive today and exists spiritually in every manner and can connect with you. You can talk to him anytime. You don't need somebody else to do that for you. You don't have to go and make an offering and get some uh, priest or somebody to talk to Jesus for you or to talk to God for you. You have direct access to God. The Bible talks about the priesthood of all believers. Every one of us is a priest before God. The Bible tells us that, that we need no other medi mediator between us and God other than Jesus Christ. He's the great high priest. Every one of us have d direct access to the throne of God through Jesus Christ. You can talk to him anytime. When you fall down, you can ask for forgiveness and he will pick you back up. Every one of us can do that every day. If we went to or 10 times a day, it doesn't matter. You fall down, you ask for forgiveness. He will pick you up, dust you off, put you right back on your merry way. When you're lonely, he'll comfort you. The Bible tells us there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's Jesus. If you're lonely, you still got Jesus. Be closer than all your relatives. When you're afraid, he will give you courage. When you're weak, yes, he'll strengthen you. And he is there for you sitting at the right hand of the Father for all eternity, 24 hours a day, seven days every week, making intercession for you. All of your needs, everything about your life, there is Jesus Christ interceding on your behalf. Let me ask you to pray with me. God, it's our prayer that each person here, as they look about their lives, Every direction they look, they would see your blessing, your goodness, your love, and your favor, and your presence in their lives. Every direction they look and every place they turn, they would see evidence of who you are as their creator, savior, redeemer. And God, it's also our prayer that each one of us would take that reality into our lives, be inspired by what we see when we look around and see all of your favor and goodness and love in our lives, and that others would be able to see that in us, and because of that could come to know you through us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? Glad to have you with us today. Na 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 And I wonder, King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I see. 
Wonderful week. God bless you. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. You are worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, 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 oh,